A blessed Sunday to all who are watching our live broadcast today. May the Lord's presence be with us as we spend the next few minutes in the study of the Word of God. Don't forget to like our FB page if you're watching this for the first time or hit the subscribe button if you're on YouTube Live. We are starting a new sermon series which we've entitled Soul Shifts. We've all been caught unawares by the COVID pandemic and the quarantined life shifting a lot of things for most of us. The routines we used to do before have totally changed and our perspectives are no longer the same. Although we live in a different pace now, there's actually one conclusion that some of us have realized. We thought it would give us a breather. And for a lot of Christians, we thought it would draw us nearer to Jesus. Unfortunately, for most of the stories I hear, it's not happening. But why is that? I think it's because our souls are actually distracted, hurried, and tired. Perhaps the quarantine made it worse? I don't know. At the very least, what I think it did was it exposed and revealed the conditions of our souls. So what I'd like to do with this series is suggest to you a couple of soul shifts, intentional changes that will somehow move us from the shallow sips with the Lord into drinking more deeply from Him so that our souls will be renewed, refreshed, and restored. So soul shifts. Today we're going to look at a problem that has no age limit. It's about distractions and the assault on our attention. We're going to look at an Old Testament passage from the book of Nehemiah. We're going to be studying Nehemiah chapter 6 verses 1 to 15, but let's start by reading a few verses. So for the note takers, you can follow along on new version where you will find there the sermon outline. So let's read Nehemiah chapter 6 verses 1 to 3. Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come and let us meet together at Hakefirim in the plain of Ono, but they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Let's pray. Jesus, we are so thankful for your shed blood on the cross, for the sacrifice that cleansed and ransomed our souls, unworthy that we are. We lift up our praises to you today, for you are worthy. We pray that you will remove any hindrance that will cause our hearts to be hardened and we incline our ears to you. Let your Holy Spirit speak to us today. And I pray that you would accomplish your purposes and that your name and your name alone will be exalted. Amen. Amen. Earlier this week, I discovered Google Assistant. If you haven't heard about it, it's an artificial intelligence system that is available on the Android mobile phone and it can really do a lot of things. For instance, let me show you. Hey Google, am I handsome? You make everyone blush. Don't you love it? One of the things that I enjoyed with the Google Assistant is that I could actually set up a routine using a specific phrase. For example, if I say good morning, it's going to tell me the weather, tell me about my reminders for the day, and read me a devotional or a specific Bible passage. I can do this the moment I wake up. I can also set an alarm or a reminder just by talking to it. Now, of course, as I was tinkering with the phone and all the features of Google Assistant, I didn't realize how time has passed me quickly. And then I remember that I was going to preach this week on distractions. And boy, was I distracted. But seriously, none of us are immune to distractions. And in today's world, it's ever present around us. Distractions are real. Distractions are significant. They affect almost everything every aspect of life. In fact, I would argue that there's never been an easier time to be distracted in the history of the world than it is today. Now, what is the most common distraction today? Well, it's the mobile phone, isn't it? This little device, although it can do much good, 
has just been around for less than two decades. But for literally thousands of years, mankind has managed to survive without it. And yet many people get anxious if they're far away from their phone for more than five minutes, right? In fact, on average, a person cannot go 10 minutes without checking his device. 10 minutes. If you wonder why you're not as productive as you'd like to be, if you wonder why your relationships are not as intimate as you know they would be, if you wonder why you're not as close to God as you'd like to be, could it be that you cannot do anything meaningful when you're interrupted every 10 minutes to stare at this little device? Now, it's not just the mobile phone, of course, or technology or social media that distracts us. For some of you, it might be people. There might be people in your life that are distracting you. Now, by all means, as followers of Christ, we want to love people. We're going to be a friend to everybody. But in our inner circle, those we spend the most time with, we want them to be people that are sharpening us, that are leading us to love Jesus and to serve Him more effectively. And this also includes the people we are dating. In fact, my heart breaks when I see Christians having unbelieving boyfriends or girlfriends simply because... Wala na ilain, or butan man siya. Don't be deceived. You cannot live the right life when you're in the company of wrong people. There are more. There are more distractions. One author surveyed leaders of different organizations and asked them what were the distractions in their lives. And common answers included work, television, radio, news, alcohol, exercise, podcasts, eating, and shopping. And the list goes on and on. So many distractions everywhere you look. The root word for distraction is actually derived from a Latin word that means a pulling apart, separating, a drawing of the mind in different directions. And here's the implication of that. The enemy doesn't need to destroy you if he can distract you. If he can distract you, eventually he'll neutralize you, or worse, you'll destroy yourself. Your distractions will pull you apart. It will draw you to directions you did not intend to go to become great at doing things that doesn't matter. It's never been easier to be passionate about wasting your time. If the devil can't destroy you, he'll get you very excited by simply distracting you. So here's what I want you to remember today, and it's this, that your life is too precious, your calling too great, and your God too good to waste your life distracted on things that do not matter. My life is too valuable, my calling too significant, my God too wonderful for me to squander my life distracted on things that have no eternal value. You know, I hope you really feel that. Your life is valuable. God made you in His image. He gave you passions. He gave you gifts. He gave you callings. He let you live at this particular time in history because it is in this time in history that you can best glorify Him. He is too good for you to waste your life. And as a Christian, the fight against destruction is the fight to focus and it's a battle worth fighting. Nehemiah gives us an illustration of how harmful distractions can be, but he also shows us a way to beat it. Now, who's Nehemiah? Very interesting. Nehemiah was an ordinary guy from the Old Testament. He was not a prophet, not a priest, not a king or a warrior. He was a regular guy who was actually serving the king of Persia as a cupbearer. Extra biblical sources mention that the office of the cupbearer in the Persian court was a position of influence. He was like a personal secretary, a chief treasurer, and keeper of the king's signet ring. But he also tasted the king's food to make sure no one had poisoned it. 
Nehemiah's time in the period of Jewish history happened after the exile where the people had begun to go back to Jerusalem from Babylon. Now he heard from a brother about the situation of his people in Jerusalem and decades had passed and no one could seem to rebuild the walls. When he heard about the plight of the people, his heart sank. He was so burdened that he prayed and fasted for months. Eventually, he goes before the king. He asks permission to leave his job, to travel back to his homeland, and to try to help with the rebuilding of the wall. So the king gave him permission to go. Now, at first, things didn't go well, but eventually they started to make progress. And what happens when we start to make progress, as the work gets better, the opposition starts to heat up. Did you ever notice that the moment you start creating movement in behalf of the things that matter to God, something will try to resist the very work that God has put in your heart? In fact, as I said earlier, if your enemy can't destroy you, he will distract you. He will do whatever he can to take your eyes off your mission, off your purpose, off your calling, and off your God. And that's what happened in this story. So the repair of the wall was starting to make headway and enemies like Sanballat, Tobiah, and a guy named Geshem shows up and tries to distract Nehemiah. And here we'll see three characteristics of distractions that I'm sure all of us will be able to relate. Three ways distractions will try to interfere, divert, and interrupt us. The first is this. First thing you'll see is that distractions will make you think it's okay. It will entice you. It will invite you. Look at the enemy's plan to divert Nehemiah off the mission of God. Verse 1 and 2 says, Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come! And let us meet together at Hakefirim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. Come, let us meet together. Oh wait, isn't this an opportunity? These guys don't like me. They hate the work I'm doing. This is a wonderful opportunity to convert them. This is a wonderful opportunity to expand my influence. But not with Nehemiah. He discerned it. He says, but they were scheming to harm me. He was aware of their plot. He was aware that they were off to no good. You know, the promise behind many of the distractions in our lives is simple. If you pay attention to me, I promise you'll stop thinking about whatever you were thinking about. I promise to take your mind off what you were focused on. In fact, that's all they have to offer. They don't necessarily give you something better to think about or focus on. They don't make you better. They will lead you somewhere else and you will be a willing participant. Now, not every distraction is bad or wrong. Sometimes we just need a break. Sometimes we need to shift our focus on something else in order to rest. Now, we'll talk about that in the next sessions, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about those things that by its very nature prevents us from giving our full attention to something, especially when it has to do with God and His purposes in our lives. So what do we see in the story? The enemies ask Nehemiah for a meeting. In verse 3, And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? In other words, no. Because he wanted to stay on task and keep building the wall. Nehemiah, will you meet with us? No. Nehemiah, can we have a meeting? No. Nehemiah, we want to talk to you about what you're doing. No, no, no. Now I will submit to you that one of the most strategic skills that you can develop in order to do what God has purposed for you is the ability to say no to other things that might distract you.
No can be a very important word. In fact, as a pastor, this is one of the hardest things for me to do. I remember a mentor once told me, if you're going to be a pastor, you're going to have to be sure you're called because the work never ends. And it's true. The work is never ending. But one thing I also realize is this. I cannot be available all the time because if I do, eventually I won't have anything to give to anyone. So I need to be strategic about my no. And you know what? Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do that something. In fact, distractions can cost you something that you cannot see, at least not immediately. And you need to understand the cost because living unaware would eventually be harmful for us. Distractions, they will make us think it's okay. Now, secondly, we need to realize that distractions can be relentless. Notice what happens to Nehemiah verse 4. And they sent to me four times this way. And I answered them in the same manner. Four times, four different times. The enemies asked for a meeting. You've got to meet us. Let's talk. Stop building for a while. Come, let's talk. Let's have coffee. And all four times, Nehemiah says, no. Now, let me insert a balance here. Some of you might say, Pastor Nick said to say no, so I'll say no all the time. Remember, Nehemiah had a mission. God had brought him to Jerusalem to help rebuild the walls. And Nehemiah was laser focused on that mission. And when he saw that the enemy had other intentions, he was discerning enough. That's why he said no. And yes, even when they were relentless. What is the most relentless distraction that has intruded in our lives today? It's technology, internet, social media, and everything is just at our fingertips. Nicholas Carr made this observation in his book, The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains, which, by the way, almost won him a Pulitzer Prize. He recounts the numerous conversations that he had with very bright young men and women, PhDs in their fields, who all confessed to a similar phenomenon. And it's this, the deterioration of their attention. Remember, these were intellectuals. These were people who lived and moved in the world of books, research, literature, technical articles. And Nicholas Carr started to corroborate from so many of them that they couldn't read books anymore. They couldn't read articles. They didn't even have the patience to read a long blog post. And I see this happening everywhere. We don't like being asked to focus on anything for very long anymore. We are adapted to the quick, short stimulus of mobile devices and social media. Do you know what TLDR means? It means too long, didn't read. Sometimes you'll see a very long article and then at the last paragraph, you'll see the letters T-L-D-R. And then you'll read a short paragraph that actually summarizes the entire article. It's for those who just want to get the gist of the article without reading the article. In other words, nobody has the attention to read the entire thing now. No wonder many of the youth today are on Twitter because you only need to read 280 characters at a time and then you can scroll up. The Facebookers are not exempt as well. Didn't you notice how we are drawn to the short headlines that catch our attention? If it's a long article, we just scroll it up, TLDR, and it's the same thing. Because of the relentlessness of these distractions, we are losing our ability to focus and pay attention longer than a few moments. We live at the depth of the text, the swipe, and the thumbs up. Mobile blindness, the quick pass, the inability to linger and dig deep. It's just about the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. The thing about giving in to our distractions, especially technology, as one youth told me, is it's just mindless scrolling and it never stops. It goes on and on and on. And the bottom line is we are in love with distraction. 
but it affects our very relationship with God. John Eldridge, in his book, Get Your Life Back, makes this observation. He said, you can't give God your attention when your attention is constantly being targeted and taken captive and you're cooperating. (laughs) That's true, isn't it? You can't find more of God when all you're able to give Him is a skim and a flicker of your attention. Friends, I fear that is what's happening to many of us today. We have become shallow somehow, taking only sips and not drinking fully of God. We're just wading in the pool and not swimming in it. Our souls feel like a shallow puddle of rain with very little traces of God's presence. We are in love with distraction and it's numbing our souls and forcing us into a shallow life. Distractions make you think it's okay. And then it's so relentless. Now, the third thing we'll see from Nehemiah is this. Distractions will draw you away from God's purpose. We know four times they invited Nehemiah to that meeting. In verse 5, it says, In the same way Sanbalat for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel, and that is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. Here's what happened. For the fifth time, Sanbalat, remember he's an enemy. He sent this open letter trying to spread false rumors about Nehemiah that he was setting himself up to rebel against the king of Persia. Notice at the end of the letter, he again invited Nehemiah to take counsel together. Come, let's meet. That's nonstop, relentless for you. But Nehemiah's answer in verse 8 says this, Then I sent to him saying, No such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out on your own mind. And here's his conclusion in verse 9. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from their work and it will not be done. But now, O God, strengthen my hands. Do you see it? Nehemiah was so aware of the schemes of the enemy and he was cognizant of the fact that their ultimate goal was to stop the work of God. And he prayed. If I'm not mistaken, you'll read in the book of Nehemiah at least 12 instances when he prayed. This guy was laser focused on the task and he knew he couldn't do it apart from God. But the enemy doesn't go away. The enemy was just as relentless and tried to trap him. And they continued to find ways to distract him from the work. You know, verse 3 is probably the personal mission statement of Nehemiah. Here he sums for us his focus. He says, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Nehemiah realized that this just isn't good work that you see. This is great work. This is something that my God created me to do. Put me in the exact place at the right time with the right king to grant me the right provision to do the right purpose to get back and inspire the right people to do something that will outlast me. This isn't just a good work. This is a great work. And Nehemiah sends the message to his haters, to the doubters, to the critics and says, I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. I'm doing a great work. I can't be bothered by your opinion. I'm doing a great work. Your criticisms will not deter me from doing what God created me to do. I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should I stop and leave and come down to you? I am doing a great work. I'm not trying to do something that's impressive. My God has called me to do something important. I don't answer to you. I'm not trying to be popular. I'm just living out my purpose. I'm doing a great 
work. You know, I can't calm down. You know, some of us need to hear that today. I'm thinking of the mom who has her hands full. Everybody at home, cleaning, cooking, laundry. And if you have babies, diapers, and short sleeps. I hope you'll hear it. You'll feel it because you want to do other things perhaps with your life right now. You're feeling a longing to do something different. And I hope you'll realize that this season won't last forever. And what you're doing right now is a great work. Embrace the great work and don't calm down. The season will pass. You can do more. And you're doing a great work. Don't calm down. Or maybe you're a youth leader or a small group leader. You're doing your best to reach out and sometimes it's just so difficult you feel like giving up. No, I will not give up. I will not back off. I will not stop. I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Or maybe you're a frontliner. By that, I'm not just talking about those who are working in the hospitals or in the medical field. I'm also talking to the workers, those whose jobs during this easy queue are on the line, those who are pulling in hours and hours of work, yet you persist even if it's hard to go to work. You go on. You pray even though you might lose your job. No, I won't give up. I'm not backing off. I'm doing a great work. You have a God given vision for something, a heart for something. You want to make a difference. And it seems like you take two steps forward and three steps back, but you don't give up the fight. You know that if you stay in the game and don't grow weary in doing good at the proper time, God says you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. No, you don't understand. This is a calling. This is a burden and I cannot shake it. I am doing what God put in my heart to do. I am doing a great work and I can't come down. Verse 15. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. You know, I just read, we just went over 100 days of quarantine. Nehemiah finished the work of the walls of Jerusalem in half that time. What I love about this is that you will read of no supernatural miracles. Notice there's no fire from heaven, no bricks just falling on each other. There's no burning bush. There's no parting of the Red Sea. There was no army of angels wielding heavenly swords. There was just an ordinary guy whose heart was so broken by the situation of his people. And he knelt down and prayed and he stood up to act. He made his plans, he inspired the people, he pushed back the critics, and he kept his eyes on the goal. Whenever the enemies would try to distract him, he said no to anything that was lesser because he was saying yes to the greater work of God. Look at verse 16. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Who was glorified? The one who called for it, of course. The one who empowered it. The one who opened the doors. The one who made it possible. It's not Nehemiah. It was God who was there in the beginning. It was God who was there in the middle. It was God who was there in the setbacks. And it was God who was there in the victory. Oh, brothers and sisters, how I wish that we have that kind of clarity. And our story today shows the importance of not letting our distractions get the better of us. Because if we do, it will deceive us into thinking that it's okay. And when we give in a little bit, it will not stop. And when it continues, we will lose sight of God and our very purpose for living. I call this series Soul Shifts because the word shift gives the idea of a slight change in position or movement or perspective. What I'd like to do today is suggest to you two simple shifts in our battle against distractions. Now, who doesn't need a strategy, right? Now, here's the first shift. Be aware of your noise. Does any of you sleep with white noise? I think some of you don't understand the question. 
Well, what some people do is this. In order to sleep better, they turn on this white noise app on their phones. Like the sound of an air conditioner or the waves of the sea or sounds of raindrops or crickets chirping. Believe it or not, keeping these sounds on helps them go to sleep. Now, one of the interesting things about white noise is that it actually masks things. It's a tool that we use to mask the things we don't want to hear. White noise is constant. If you take a moment and listen, whatever room you're in, you'll probably hear the sound of something around you. Maybe it's people walking by or music in the background or the slight hum of the electric fan. You'll also notice that it's really unnoticeable at times. When you're just walking through life, you don't stop to listen to all the noise around you. It's just always there and it's hard to even hear unless you actually listen for it. Now, every single person in this life has his finger on some kind of white noise. Whether it's the Netflix that you're binging on or the social media that you're always checking up on or the news that you're always consuming, you've got your fingers on the dial of something that you turn up to mask the things that you don't want to feel or hear or think about. White noise is a form of distraction. The danger of living in a world of constant distractions is not the distractions themselves, it's the things that we use to block them out. Now, what's your white noise? Would you be willing to just state that this is the noise that I use to cover up the things I don't want to hear or think or feel? If you can't do this alone, the great news is the people around you, the ones closest to you, they probably know it and they would love to tell you. In fact, if you've asked them and you don't want to hear them say it, just ask them to text it to you. And they probably will and it might actually be the phone that is the noise that you turn to. But would you be willing to name it? Just say it. This is my distraction. It's my cell phone. It's the social media. Proverbs 14.8 says, The prudent understands where they are going, but fools deceive themselves. I want you to picture your fingers on that volume knob. What do you go to when life is crazy or boring or busy? What is your noise? What is keeping you distracted lately and why? Now, the second one, the second shift is this. Pay attention to God. The distractions of our lives literally changes our ability to focus. And friends, this isn't just a cultural crisis or the problem of technology. This is a spiritual crisis. Because our soul's need for love and restoration and intimacy and connection with God all hinge on our ability to give God our attention. Let's look at this contrast that we see in Psalm chapter 1 from the New Living Translation. It says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season, and their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do, but not the wicked. They are like worthless shafts scattered by the wind. There are two types of experiences being described here, two kinds of realities. You have the person whose life is so green and lush because its roots are deep into the river of God, into the river of life. And that person is able to meditate on the beauty and goodness of God. They are able to give sustained attention to God. On the other hand, we have the other person who is so lacking in substance, a life so shallow it's described as like worthless shaft that's blown away by the wind. And the question we must ask ourselves is this, am I paying attention to God? Am I conscious of Him or am I distracted? If it were a muscle, is the muscle growing or is it getting weaker? You know, there are people who used to read books that no longer read books because it takes too much concentration. They now only read blogs and summaries because their attention span has grown shorter. 
In Psalm 19 verse 1 to 3, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Truth is, there is really no place or situation where God cannot communicate to us. It's always a matter of paying attention or noticing or keeping ourselves aware to where God has already been active in our lives. So here's what you can do this week. Take some time every day to just pay attention to God. Is He saying something? Is He telling you to trust Him with the unknown? Is He showing you something beautiful? Is He expressing His love to you by His provision? Is God reminding you of His power? Everybody sees the beauty. It's in front of everyone, right? The heavens declare the glory of God. But what most people do is they look at it and they go, ah, and then just go on with their day. The secret is to stop, to pay attention, and to receive it and say, thank you, Lord, for this gift. So two simple shifts. Be aware of the noise and distraction of your life. And secondly, pay attention to God. Now, obviously, we will not be able to eliminate all the distractions from our life. However, these simple steps can go a long way in getting us back on track in a world that's, well, gone crazy. And one thing we can learn from Nehemiah is this. Your life and my life is too precious. Your calling is too great. And your God is too good to waste your life distracted on things that do not matter. You'll never finish what you don't start. But we all need a bit of soul shift when it comes to our distractions. According to Kerry Lotsoff, at least 55% of the population of the UK cannot see the stars when they look up at the night sky. It's because these cities create so much light that the beauty of the stars in the sky is virtually invisible to more than half of the people living there. In places where too much light is produced at night, people lose the opportunity to see the natural light of the stars. Contrast that to a night out away from the city on a clear night sky. I believe most of us have experienced this before. One time during one of the retreats, we went to a place out of Cebu, and I remember looking at the cloudless sky that night, and the stars were beautifully shining. Now here's a dumb question. Were the stars out when I was on that retreat brighter than the stars you might see in the UK or in New York or in Beijing? Of course not. They are the same stars with the same light traveling millions of light years to reach our eyes. But they appear brighter to you and me when the pollution, the interference of other lights is diminished. In places of little to no light pollution, the stars aren't shining any brighter. It's simply that you and I can finally see them as they are. When you remove the distortion other light creates, the stars seem to shine brighter. Remove the distortion and you will see more clearly. Quiet the distractions and you will gain more clarity. Let's pray. Lord, we know we are a very distracted people. Right now, as you remind us of who you are, we bow our hearts to you in reverence, in thankfulness, and in praise. Help us, teach us to focus our eyes on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.